let you guys for making it to this session. I'm sure you had a long and uh, fruitful podcast uh, camp uh, Toronto 2014. Um, you guys are the hardcore who remain. Um, so you can now relax because you know the learning stops here. Uh, first, we'll talk about you know what what qualifies me to talk about digital history and maps. Um, well. Actually, I don't have any qualifications. Uh, I'm uh, not a historian, uh, not a geographer. I just happen to be somebody who's particularly passionate about uh, Toronto history, uh, Toronto heritage, and um, uh, information about, about the past of our city and how it came to be. I also happen to have uh, created uh, last year a site called uh, Historical Maps of Toronto, which is uh, an online collection of easy to use uh, um, uh, maps of like important maps of the city um, dating from roughly the late 1700s to the 1800s uh, and into early 1900s. Uh, it's a very simple site. Uh, here's kind of like the, the main index page for it. Uh, each uh, particular page, uh, each particular map has its own page and uh, a bit of historical context uh, so that people can understand why the particular map is important and details uh, on the map which they might find interesting. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, there are a number of uh, topics. Uh, first of all, I want to discuss you know, why are maps interesting? What makes them useful as historical documents? Um, and we're going to I'll, I'll sort of sideline into it, talking about a couple of them along the way because I enjoy doing that. Uh, I want to talk about some of the challenges facing uh, historians and researchers uh, in terms of maps and history in general in Toronto. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, maps project itself, uh, the implementation and execution of it, uh, what tools I used, uh, and what kind of um, you know approach I used to promote and generate uh, media coverage for it. And then lastly, I'll kind of wrap up uh, talking about the future and of digital mapping and what it holds for us. Um, so maps, how are they useful as historical documents? Um, so, you know, presumably the, the question, you know, why you're here. And I think to answer that question, uh, the simplest way is to, to look at an example of a map. Um, and talk a little bit about it. Uh, this particular map is uh, from 1818, um, sort of before the incorporation of the city, in fact. It's by Lieutenant, it was sort of surveyed and drawn by uh, Lieutenant George Philpotts of the Royal Engineers. And uh, the map is hand drawn on the. Um, what I find interesting looking at these maps is that you can see, you know, maps are. You can think of them as snapshots of a particular time and place. Uh, they're kind of windows into the past. And when you look at these historical maps, uh, you can really sort of gain, gain insight into how the city became what it is today. Um, there are a couple of details that are really interesting about this particular map. Uh, you'll see here this sort of grid this of, of 10 blocks. That's kind of like the, the original uh, sort of settlement, I guess, Toronto, the original blocks. And that grid pattern of streets uh, sort of expanded and is still with us today. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of expansion uh, westward as well. Uh, so there's a, it's very hard to see on the screen, but there's a, there's a little red line that goes up here and along here. This whole area was the military reserve surrounding uh, Fort York, which is still the same. But this line here is Queen Street. So everything north of Queen Street was just basically like forest or scrub, farmland occasionally. Um, we also see the influence of uh, rivers on Toronto history. Uh, here's a, the line of uh, Garrison Creek. And if you look at a modern map, you'll find that uh, Niagara Street kind of falls this line. Uh, other creeks, uh, there's Tallow Creek and uh, the River Dawn on this side. Um, still there, but in altered form today. 
Um, and that, it's that contrast between uh, what was there before and uh, what's now that I find particularly interesting. Um, so, to kind of summarize, using historical maps as an approach to storytelling or to, to, to learning about history uh, is really powerful because they're, they're subjective on two levels. Uh, the first level is that, you know, what was, why was the map created? What was the map maker's intent? Um, you know, maps are abstractions. They only contain, you know, what's important from the map maker's perspective. And in this particular case, it was a military map, and so there's, you know, details about topography and the layout of the town and that sort of thing. Oh, the other quite interesting thing here is Toronto Island is not even an island yet. In 1850 something, uh, there's a big storm that created Eastern Canada. Yeah. Um, sorry, to get back to the point, uh, the other level of subjectivity, the, you know, the flip side is uh, it's dependent on, you know, our interpretation of the map. And, you know, you have to close your eyes and imagine the Toronto that it was um, based on the representation that you see on the, on the map. Um, so that I find particularly compelling. Um, at the same time, uh, maps can be really frustrating because um, they're not continuous. There are gaps. You know, years will pass between maps, and there just isn't any. There just isn't anything. Uh, one of the one of the maps that I, a map that I would really love to see, is uh, that depicting uh, prior to you know 1812. Uh, sorry, uh, the, some of the garrison on Fort York used to be on the other side of the creek uh, before the Americans came and burned it down. Um, and I would love to see a map of that, but there just isn't any. So there are, there are gaps and, and the kind of in the uh, in maps, which, which is also an interesting struggle for people to do. Um, so just to recap, uh, you know, there, maps are snapshots of a particular time and place. Uh, I do find often uh, these older maps uh, have an aesthetic quality to them because they're manually produced, or you know, like either hand drawn or carefully, you know, uh, you know, engraved in stone and lithographed. Um, I talked about you know they're being subjected on two levels, um, and really, what's interesting about maps is you, you can, and particularly with respect to Toronto, is you're constantly aware of the tension between what's changed and what's stayed the same, and it's that tension that kind of gives you an idea about how Toronto uh, into the belt, uh, into the city is today. Um, now, uh, I think the, the next step we're going to talk about is sort of uh, the story behind the historical maps of Toronto site. Um, and there's some serious rambling that's about to occur. Uh, I'm a rock climber, and I used to climb uh, for many years at a uh, gym called the Rock Oasis. And it was located in a 120-year-old uh, warehouse located at uh, the corner of Front and Bathurst. Um, and that, that top photo is actually from almost a century ago, uh, 1916, I think. Um, from the outside, uh, it was just kind of an ugly shed, but on the inside, you know, I spent a lot of time there, had a lot of fun, made many friends. Um, now, in a particularly kind of Toronto story, uh, due to, you know, rising land values, uh, increased levels of taxation, um, and sort of municipal bylaws, the, you know, a developer was able to acquire the site and they tore down uh, the building uh, to make way for condos. Um, and uh, at the time, I was really bitter about it, I would say. I just, you know, I, when you spend a lot of time uh, using a particular building or being around a particular building, you would develop an emotional attachment to it. And um, I decided to write uh, you know, a history of the building to kind of celebrate its uh, usage and its lifetime, and kind of its passing. Um, because uh, our industrial heritage is actually something uh, that we often overlook in terms of heritage preservation, because for the most part, industrial buildings are, are kind of ugly. Um, but yet they still are an important part of you know, our history. Uh, so 
I went and did a whole bunch of research uh, about that particular building um, in order to you know, write about it. And it turns out um, that researching uh, buildings <laughs> in Toronto is a real pain in the neck. Um, because unless it's a famous building, uh, then you, know, you can just look it up in Wikipedia. Right? But if it's just you know, building on this street, uh, you have to go and look at uh, city directories, you have to go and look at building permits, uh, you know, do title searches and that sort of thing. One of the main tools, kind of getting to maps, is uh, if you go to the reference library and you ask them, I want to find out about a particular uh, building, one of the main tools is what's known as Goad's Atlas of the City of Toronto. Um, and there's a picture of Charles Goad, amazing beard. Uh, he, he produced uh, kind of these beautiful Victorian era fire insurance plans. And uh, they cover a span of many years from roughly 1880 to you know, onwards. Um, and what they are, just showing you an example, is um, in their series of plates covering the entire city. And they're color coded and they contain like a wealth of information about uh, building material, uh, like construction materials, building shapes and sizes, and you can kind of see you know, the interrelationships between buildings within a given neighborhood. Um, and so this is map for kind of 1884 for the particular area that I was looking at. And then if you look at, skip ahead uh, six years to 1890, um, I can see that my building has shown up, which means that I can now sort of reasonably say that uh, the building was built between these two points of time, and then I can narrow my focus in terms of the research. And in terms of my exposure to these maps, I really found them you know, really beautiful and really interesting. Um, but the thing is, uh, there were problems. Um, now, at the time, now, okay, the main problem with maps in general is that you know, we live in a digital age. You know, everybody here has a smartphone. On that phone, you've got like, access to Google Maps and real-time information on you know, carnal transit services and amazing stuff going on. But the fact is that most historical maps are analog, and that, and that causes a whole bunch of problems. Um, at the time, uh, you, you know, to see these GOAD plans, you required you know, physical access to view. And that means you know, actually going down to the you know, Toronto Reference Library, or the City of Toronto Archives, or uh, the Maps and Data Library at, at Robarts at the University of Toronto, um, or paying a visit to Ottawa, the Library and Archives Canada. Um, and uh, that's great if you are, you know, an academic who's actually studying this stuff. But if you just, you know, don't really have a lot of time for that, uh, it's it's that's physically inconvenient. Um, you can't just like, you know, at ten o'clock in your pajamas say, hey, I wonder, you know, what, whether this particular building was was here or not. Um, you have to, you know, arrange a trip or whatever. Now, each of these institutions has kind of begun to digitize. You know, they've embarked on. Uh, digitization processes, um, which are Herculean in scope. Um, basically, the mandate is digitize everything. Um, but uh, as with any kind of you know first run attempts at things, uh, there were issues that you know that I encountered because I happened to be doing research at that particular time. For example, uh, you had weird file formats. Uh, the City of Toronto Archives, um, the file format from their scanner uh, that they output. Uh, was actually like developed, you know, by the CIA for geographical information uh, systems. And in order to view the files, you had to install like a, this, third, this proprietary third-party extension, which could only be installed on certain early versions of Internet Explorer. And then, uh, so that ruled out, you know, any Mac or Linux access. And then, if, even if you managed to jigger your environment so that you could install the, the extension, the software itself was like really horrible. It was like a time machine back and forth. Bad 1990s software. Um, uh, other other issues were, you know, Toronto, Toronto Public Library. They've had, you know, reasonable success in terms of, you know, scanning things and putting them in their catalog. But uh, the problem is their catalog is, you know, a system meant to, you know, catalog books, and it, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to historical artifacts so much. Um, in this particular case, but just, you know, in the example there. Uh, they're all the titles uh, of the plates are identical. 
Um, so, and they're not sorted in any particular order, and the thumbnail is too small to actually see what it is. So in order to actually find something, you'd have to basically manually go and click through each, each one, and there are like 300 plates to sort through a pain in the neck. Um, and then last example, very quickly, at Library and Archives Canada, they just had really painful online navigation where uh, they would give you, you'd be able to find the set of things that you wanted, but only be able to page through them like you know five entries at a time. Um, so if your entry was you know somewhere in the middle, you just have to page, wait for the thing to load, page, wait for the thing to load. It's really awkward. Uh, I did find that search tended to be okay, except the problem is that you actually need to know uh, what you're looking for in terms of uh, title, creator, date it was published, or whatever. There was there's an issue in terms of the serendipity of things. You weren't able to accidentally discover something cool. You had to actually know what you're looking for. Um, and you know, so the key issue is, you know, what if you don't even know that a map exists? Well, then you will never find it. You'll never see it. You'll never be able to use it. Um, and that applies to, to anyone who's you know looking for it. So the bottom line there is now all all, all these examples. I don't mean I don't need to actually sound that critical of the institutions. Um, they're horribly from a you know, researcher's perspective, they're horribly under-resourced, and they have a lot of other priorities uh, that are competing and that they have to attend to. You know, the library actually has to you know, pay your staff and buy books you know, and keep the branches open. Uh, at, you know, at archives, they have to pay attention to conservation and preservation of the actual artifacts. Uh, so you know, digitization is kind of like in their mandate, but it's, it's, you know, it's a side entry. So, I don't want to sound like uh, I'm being too critical about their things. They're, they're doing the best that they can with the limited resources that they have available. Um, it just happens to be a, a real uh, challenge for researchers. Um, and the summary summary is for normal people, you know, uh, just your average person, there are too many barriers uh, impeding easy access uh, to these plans. And that kind of really got me going and thinking, well, what you really want is are, you know, to make these resources available in a fashion that anyone can use, um, because most people are now familiar where they can use an internet browser uh, and you get them to sort of a centralized site where uh, they can, you know, that's easy to navigate and you know, simple to use, uh, you'll get a lot further in terms of the propagation and distribution and use of these documents. Um, so you, you want it to be online, you want it to be free to everybody, you want it to be easy to use. Uh, it's nice if you have a somewhat curated selection so that uh, the stuff that is important is what gets highlighted. Uh, and if I was going to do it, uh, and another, another important factor was uh, I wanted to be low maintenance. Uh, so the first little project that I did was to sort of extract uh, all the publicly available Go plans uh, from the various institutions and then put them up on a centralized site, uh, which I call the Gold's Atlas in the city of Toronto. Um, and I got tremendous positive feedback from researchers on it. They found it really useful. I got feedback from people who you know, were able to find out the street that their grandmother lived on and the house, you know, they were able to see their house. It was all very exciting. Um, and then you sort of, you know, nothing happened. Kind of a year passed. But in the back of my mind, there was another plan called the 1858 uh, Bolton Atlas of the City of Toronto, which was kind of like a predecessor map to these GOAD plans. And it's important because uh, the GOAD plans only go as far back as 1880, and 1858 is just like that much further back in the past and provides key information. Um, and in, in addition to that, uh, I was like, well, I should really put this 1858 Bolton Atlas up online. And as well, uh, the City of Toronto Archives had posted sort of six other maps, but in their weird format that no one could access. Um, so I felt that they were trapped there. Um, and then um, I was puttering around the reference library, and s somehow I found in sort of uh, their request-only sort of stacks uh, a copy of uh, called uh, Mapping Toronto's First Century. Um, and what it is is kind of a typewriter transcript of sort of the exhibit text from a 1984 Royal Ontario Museum exhibit on uh, important Toronto maps. And it was sort of put together by Isabel Ganton and uh, Joan Winnerls, who was the former librarian of, former 
math librarian at the University of Toronto. And uh, it was a really interesting read, but it didn't have any, you know, didn't have any maps, uh, like really, uh, that you could use. It was just the text of the exhibits, um, and it was kind of restricted in the sense that you could only go to the library and, and request it. So basically, no one was going to find it. So my particular copy was given to me by, by a historian who happened to, to have a copy of his collection. Um, and, I, and I was really struck by that, and I thought, well, that's an excellent guide to what other maps uh, I should find and put up online, as well as giving me some information as to the institutions uh, where they were actually being held. Because again, it goes back to that whole thing of, you know, if you don't know that a map exists, then you're not going to be able to, to find it. Um, so basically, since the exhibit in 1984, nobody had really seen these uh, maps in public, other than you know, the odd historian or researcher um, or academic. Um, so the, the primary issues were all these maps are like scattered between multiple institutions, and they were hard to you know, discover, navigate, and, and access. Um, so the end result of that was after some amount of labor, I started to put together uh, a site called Historical Maps of Toronto, um, which again is a collection of uh, important maps that uh, you know covers you know many points in, the, in uh, Toronto's history. It's very simple. I you know provide a linear kind of chronological list you know, in, of of maps. You know each each map has its own page, and when you click on the thumbnail for each page, uh, you can view like a high resolution version of the of the plan. Uh, that led to a spin-off project called uh, Fort York and Garrison Collin Maps, uh, which I'm doing uh, in collaboration with the Friends of Fort York uh, on uh, maps uh, about Fort York and the surrounding <coughs> military reserve. Um, so those are kind of like two sister projects, I guess. Um, so the exciting thing is, is that people do use it. That's, that makes me happy. You know, I've gotten great feedback from students, uh, teachers, researchers, uh, historians, Real estate agents, oddly enough, uh, genealogists, people who just want to know more about their neighborhood um, or, 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 or the past of the city. Uh, I've got good feedback with that. Okay, I want to quickly talk about the tools uh, that I use to, to create the sites. Um, and this part is not meant to evangelize the particular tool set that I used, because they're they're quite primitive actually, but more to, you know, just uh, engage the thought process around choosing what particular tools uh, is, is our right the, the key things for me were I wanted it to be you know simple, scalable, and, and easy. Uh, so I use Blogger uh, for my sites, and I know some of you are like cringing, you know, why don't you have a self-hosted you know, WordPress site? I just need a simple tool for, you know, I'm a simple guy, and the site is not, it doesn't have, need all that kind of crazy functionality. Uh, the hosting is free. I don't have to worry about you know, paying for anything. I'm cheap. It scales under load. Uh, I can have you know, 50,000 people hit it, and it doesn't matter because it's all just on Google servers somewhere. Um, it's just a very simple approach. Uh, and it's, 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 again, not that I'm propagating you know, a proponent of Blogger necessarily, but it was just, like a, it was just the right tool for my particular application. So in your own particular projects, just consider what are your requirements before you, you, you choose the tool. Uh, in terms of hosting the uh, high resolution images of, of the maps, uh, I host my stuff on Google Drive, because uh, you know, each account has 15 gigs, and that's you know, a reasonably large amount of space that you can put stuff up on. Uh, stuff is shared in a public folder, and uh, I just basically direct link, you know, e Google Drive provides uh, a direct link um, URL uh, to the files, and when you, you, know, you, you basically attach that to the thumbnail, and when you click on the thumbnail, it loads uh, the corresponding uh, image. Uh, you know, alternates that you might consider using, you know, for hosting stuff. You know, I did consider using Dropbox, but again, there were kind of constraints around. Like, free is like a really important thing for me. Uh, Dropbox does have free stuff, but there are you know cap limits, um, and again, with Google Drive. It's you know a thousand machines at Google just waiting to serve whatever, uh, and I don't have to worry about any crazy spikes capping me out just at the you know if I get some media coverage or some popularity, anything like that. Uh, <coughs> um, 
So uh, I want to quickly talk about you know, promotion, media coverage. This is like the fun part where you, you have a project, uh, you get to talk about it and how great it is. Uh, so it's kind of like indulging in their narcissist. Um, the project did receive a, quite a fair amount of uh, coverage uh, from different channels. So, you know, Toronto's like newspaper in terms of newspaper, uh, radio, television, and internet. Um, you know, kind of all, all, those, uh, all those channels. Um, so the question is, you know, how did I go about, you know, you have a simple site, how did you go about making noise about it? Uh, well, it's fairly simple. <laughs> very, very, very simple approach. Uh, I created a target list of, you know, people that I wanted to you know, see it or make noise about it, and then uh, I contacted them. <laughs> so it's like rocket science. Um, and then, of course, you need to track it. You know, if you were doing this professionally, you would, you know, use some sophisticated CRM system uh, to do it, but I, for my purposes, I just, you know, made a spreadsheet and, you know, color, you know, color coded, you know, what the state of affairs was. Um, and I tracked, you know, who responded, who didn't, what was their response? What was my response to their response? And you know, you're kind of developing a, a bit of a relationship for the next go round for, for the future. Um, yeah, and then follow. -up. Very simple, very straightforward. So there's no, you know, no magic. Uh, I did try to take a bit of a phased approach because you, you know, you're trying to build up hype, but uh, some, sometimes it takes time. Um, first of all, you know, you, you email you know, the cool people who are in the know, and hopefully they will start, you know, pushing it out on social media. You know. Like as for myself, you know, I do have a Twitter account, but you know, I, you know, I'm not a celebrity. I just have a few, uh, you know, hundred followers. What you really want is you want these cool people to be tweeting about. Um, and you also contact, you know, blogs, and then print media. You know, the report, reporters there, they you know keep track of. You know, you know, professional blogs and that's what Toronto's blog. So they read that stuff, and it's at that point where you can pitch uh, to the reporters and say, "Hey, there's a lot of hype. We can generate. Um, we can start. You know, how to like do an article." Um, and then radio and television are some other crazy world. And I don't really understand how that works, but uh, if they see something big happening, they'll they'll call you. <laughs> it's basically what I'm asking. And sometimes there's a bit of a timing element because. Uh, you, you know, they, in theory, they're all competitive, and they like to have the scoop on. Um, so you don't want to kibosh these things. Well, pro tip: if you do have interviews, uh, try to prepare for them beforehand and have sound bites ready. When I was doing uh, an interview with uh, CTV about it, the interviewer asked me a two-part question, and uh, you know, when the lights are on, the camera's rolling. And you get nervous, whatever, and I answered the first part of the question, and then my mind was blank, and I had no idea what the second part of the question was. Uh, in terms of you know SEO and you know Google, uh, search, like improving your search rankings. Honestly, uh, my results have varied. Like I, I, you know, in the ideal world, you wind up ranking number one for your particular, uh, you know, your particular set of keywords. Um, just try and keep working on you know those organic inbound links from blogs and other media, and you know good luck to you. I've had I've had I had one funny scenario at one point at, at near the height of the hype where I had like eight pages of results that were all like articles about the project, and then on the ninth page was the uh, was the actual link to my project. So Google is kind of like a mystery to me sometimes. You just have to keep working on it. Um, and eventually, you know, their algorithm recognizes that, oh, all these people are talking about this site, and they promote that particular site. Uh, now, in talking about all this, you might say, well, any idiot could have done that. And my answer to that is yes, and <laughs> I, I am the idiot who did do it. <laughs> Sorry. The, no, but the, but the takeaway there is that uh, you just have to be persistent, and you have to just, you know, go and do it. You don't have to be a subject, you don't even have to be a subject matter expert. You just pretend to be one, and, and you know you, you just you know grit your teeth and, and get to get to it. Um, now, I run short on time here, but what does the future hold? Um, it, we're at what I would describe as the golden age of mapping in terms of the you know digital history. Uh, 
there are all kinds of things that if you're you know, aware of the space, you'll, you'll hear about. If you attend some of the earlier sessions today, you might have heard of some of these things, like uh, GIS, you know, geographical information systems, about uh, rich data sets, about you know, georeferencing, that's the process of, sort of assigning uh, latitude and longitude to particular points on the image that correspond to real world coordinates. Um, and that lets you sort of make layers and mashups and you know, create richer applications uh, that leverage um, you know, maps in new and exciting ways. We, you know, uh, I think the, and for those of you who want to find out more, I would look up uh, Marcel Fortin. He's the sort of library, current librarian um, of the Maps and Data Library at the University of Toronto. He's sort of really the main proponent of this space, I guess. He's the leader who's locally known for, for doing stuff at any rate. Um, if you read uh, Metro earlier this week, um, or blog TO or Torontoist, you might have read about uh, this particular project, which was called the Toronto Historic Maps Viewer. Um, this is an example of you know taking things to the next level. Uh, this gentleman by the name of Chris Olson, who was able to take the aggregated uh, GOAD plans that I had put up, and then georeference them, and then uh, stitch them all together, and then put them on a, a new website where uh, you're able to kind of zoom in and pan around just like on Google Maps. And as well, most importantly, you can kind of switch between years and sort of fade in and out between years. And it's going to be, I think, a really exciting tool for uh, you know, exploring uh, Toronto's history because you can really chart the development of particular neighborhoods. And that's you know, really exciting to me because it's taking uh, this you know, historical information which was you know, to a certain degree trapped and you know, presenting it in a new form that's interactive and dynamic. Um, and it, again, it's easy to use and you know, people can relate to um, To kind of wrap up, I, you know, I just, it's my strong personal belief that you know, historical information uh, belongs to all of us. Um, you know, it's important to share and distribute that information because uh, you never know who can benefit from it or make use of it to, you know, and transform it uh, to, to create something new. Um, and if you've attended some of the other sessions on, you know, open data, it was just, you know, open data day was just the other day. Uh, you know, having this, it, you know, making the information available is like the first step. And then who knows, you know, that leads to an explosion of new and exciting stuff. Um, oh, and the asterisk there is, you know, what about copyright? Uh, most of the maps uh, that I've got on my site, uh, in theory, are you know in the public domain. Some belong technically to the crown and are copyright the crown. You still have to write the Minister of Natural Resources to give you permission to reproduce this stuff. Um, the there's a small subdivision of CGI uh, that actually asserts a copyright interest in some of the GOAD plans, um, but they've kind of arranged. Uh, and an agreement with uh, Library and Archives Canada and some other municip municipalities for like a 90-year rolling window of, on their plans. Um, but it's still a very sensitive area. I had a conversation earlier this week with a York activist, a York University activist, ar archivist. Um, they had a 1917 copy of the plan, but they were unwilling to scan it and publish it because they were afraid of getting sued. Even though it's outside that 90-year window, uh, it's still a kind of contentious area. But ideologically, you know, history belongs to all of us. Um, I will skip over this. I'll, I'll go back to this sort of after because the time's about to run out. Because um, I have sort of have thrown in a bonus uh, map to look at. This one's from 1851, and you can kind of see that Toronto has sort of exploded in the, in the interim. Um, and that's the last slide I hear. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to address them. Uh, my Twitter's at Nathan A. Uh, the historical maps project is uh, oldtorontomaps.blogspot.com, and I do blog at uh, scritch.blogspot.com. Oh, I still have ten minutes. Well, uh, do you want me to answer your question, or do you want me to talk about the other map? Go ahead. Okay. Well, very quickly, I didn't have that much to say necessarily. Uh, this plan uh, was produced by. So, uh, what, you, what I can't really show you here is. In, present, in presenting the high-resolution files, 
uh, you, you know, on your browser, you can actually like you know expand the image and, and see the particular details. So it's not just like looking at the map in, to, in, to, in totality. You can actually, you know, the value of it is being able to you know sit at home in your pajamas and scrutinize the particular area of your that you're interested in. Now this particular map was from uh, I believe 1851, and it was uh, produced well. One, the main, a main author is uh, Sanford Fleming, uh, who's an important uh, character in Toronto history and you know, Canadian scientific endeavor. You can Google his name. Um, he uh, produced this map in 1851, and you can see, in contrast to that plan that I showed you guys earlier, um, you know, where you had the original like set of square blocks here. You know, Toronto has started to become like a metropolis. Still got a ways to go. You can see, still see large stretches of, of empty space where they still got, they got the, the plots of land out of the you know, belt. But there's considerably more development. Um, and the grid, again, that you know stays with us today is, is still there. Um, you can see that uh, the military reserve is largely kind of uh, still untouched at that particular time, though they built the new fort. Um, this is old Fort York, and this is when they built the new fort. The only sort of building that remains is like Stanley Barracks, this building right like here. It's still there, everything else is gone. Uh, here was where they have uh, the Lunatic Asylum, which is where Cam H is presently. Um, other interesting things, I do find aesthetically, it's a, it's a beautiful map. Uh, they've got these sort of engravings of important you know, civic structures around the edges. Um, and what I find interesting is, uh, you know, the, that you know most of them are you know, banks and churches. So those are kind of like, the, from their perspective, you know, the important structures, uh, the important civic structures of the, of the city. Um, let's see what else is there. Again, you know, you can see one aspect which I didn't really have time to talk about, but uh, if you ever get a chance to see Helen Mills of, of the Lost Rivers Project talk about stuff, um, you know, just rivers in Toronto, uh, we buried a lot of the rivers or altered you know, their courses or you know, turned them into sewers or whatever. But uh, their influence does remain with us today. You know, Garrison Creek uh, is largely buried, and. Uh, But you can still see, like, if you actually walk through the neighborhoods that follow the path of the creek, uh, you can still see, you know, where it flowed and, you know, how it influenced the geography of, of the area. Um, I don't know what I was going to say, but in any case, look up lostrivers.ca. It's very interesting uh, what's happening with Garrison. Um, that's kind of all I want to say about this map. At this point. You had a question, sir. I'm uh, curious about your motivation to start with. Do you have a, a cartographic background? Or, uh, and, and I ask that from the standpoint. I wrote maps as well, and uh, I've gone this far with it. I never considered that love of maps to be normal, especially. <laughs> so I'm just wondering how you started and why. Well, um, did, sorry, did, what, didn't I just talk about that? Right now? I mean, you in, in, in but, terms uh, of you know, the motivation. Uh, I was personally really frustrated by the level of access to the maps that I wanted to see. At the particular time I was doing the research for a, an essay about a historical building, I, I, had, I was forced to go and visit the reference library a whole bunch of times to look at these maps. And uh, although, that, although I do recommend it, you should, there's nothing like seeing uh, one of these maps in person right in front of you, this historical artifact. Uh, it was still really inconvenient for me, and I thought, well, this. Sh my my main thought was, why isn't this online? Uh, and uh, I just happened to be the person who put this stuff online. Like it's arguable that all oh, you could put online in a better format or whatever. But just I got tired of it and decided to put stuff up. Um, in terms of you know creating like a somewhat comprehensive selection. It's kind of like being, you know, a collector of trading cards. You know, you get one, and you know, you're like, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice if you also had this particular plan up? And the thing is, there aren't actually that many notable 
like the, the set of notable maps is not actually that large, you know, like, you just say arbitrarily like 100. So if you add one, you've, you've incrementally increased the value by, you know, 1%. So percentage increase is like, it's easy to do. Um, and so when I, when I only had like seven maps up, it was like super easy. It was like, oh, I'll just add one more and make it 10, make the whole site 10% more valuable to anyone who's looking. Um, so we just kind of uh, led on uh, one thing to the next. In terms of this, uh, some of the later, the, the later project, the Fort York uh, project, uh, I was kind of approached by uh, local historian Stephen Otto, and he's sort of the chair of the Friends of Fort York, and he's also sort of a notable local historian. And he wanted to, you know, explore further kind of some of the history around Fort York, and that's kind of the uh, driving force of that particular project. So, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so, so John had an Aboriginal history before seminary. Right? What if you consider going even further back? Are even maps available? It's okay. Well, hopefully the Wi-Fi will. Now the earliest that I go is roughly speaking, uh, like there's a plan of the Toronto Purchase from 1787. Um, and before that, uh, there are maps of, you know, kind of Ontario areas uh, that denote uh, something like Toronto or York or whatever. Um, but there's no like there's no detail like it's you know a dot on the on the north shore of Lake Ontario or whatever so that doesn't necessarily uh, you know interest me um, so yeah the earliest that I go is uh, is kind of like a sketch of the original just the, the orientation this is Lake Ontario and you just you know they they're, the maps are tend to be a lot like this where you just have like you know Toronto. And so uh, my, you know, I'm a local person. I am most interested in uh, maps of Toronto proper. Um, the cartography of uh, Ontario is in itself a whole fascinating area, which I would encourage someone to do, <laughs> to follow up on. And, you know, uh, and is, there a, is there a crowdsource element to what you're doing? Are people starting to submit to you like online, other maps of interest that, that help build in this uh, archive? Um, no. <laughs> the, the, it's, uh, it's largely a matter of you know, just doing the research and finding out what maps uh, exist. Um, I had the good fortune to actually, the, the Fort York project actually had a, it's forward written by Joan Bernals, who was the foreign map librarian. She's, like, she literally has taught the course on early maps uh, in Toronto. So. Uh, her, you know, published publications are a good resource for, for finding what maps um, are available. Now, in terms of the crowdsourcing, uh, this goes back to the the, the, the future of mapping. Um, the uh, British Library did a really fascinating uh, crowdsourcing example of georeferencing recently, where they had a whole bunch of maps, and they needed them. Like georeferencing basically allows you to overlay an old map uh, with like Google Maps, so that you can see like you, you can fade between the two that's like that's the primary benefit of key referencing from my from a lay person's perspective technically not true but whatever um, and they had like you know a, a few thousand plans uh, that would have taken you know some person like a long time to do and they were able to partner with a company called map tyler and uh, crowdsource they, they were able to put up a website where they invited people to do the georeferencing for them um, and that is something that I'm kind of trying to explore uh, with uh, Marcel Fortin at UT um, in terms of georeferencing some of these other maps. But he might be able to get me a student to do it, so that's just as good from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we'll see, that's in super preliminary discussion, and we'll see, we'll see what happens uh, from there. Sorry. In, excuse me. 
in seeing the maps from the past and seeing the gaps, yes. you have a wish list of, I wish there was such a map here and here. What do you wish for map makers from today moving forward that they make about the city of Toronto? I'm just thinking very simply, the ride guide. That's the map that most Torontonians today are familiar with You're today's Toronto. The GDCs, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, they're, that's they're actually undergoing uh, the uh, redesign. Yes, they are. Uh, it's really hard to say. The uh, the it, if you were to fast forward a hundred years and you know talk to a historian then, kind of looking back at now, they they would they they would say in terms of the data set that's available to them, like it kind of falls off a cliff like around now. Like starting from now, there is a rich panoply of information available uh, in terms of satellite, aerial imagery, uh, open, like if you attended some of the other sources, like open data from governments, like, you know, war boundaries and uh, flu clinic locations and, you know, street, you know, fire hydrants and that, and that sort of thing. Like all that stuff is starting to get published by governments and institutions. Um, but pre now, uh, it just there isn't any, um, and I think future historians will find that really frustrating. It's it's kind of like uh, uh, looking, trying to look up old newspapers, where uh, like in terms of analogy, similar research. Like if you you know just are interested in the stuff in the last like. 50 years, it's, it's really easy to get a copy of the, the Toronto Star from 50 years ago. But as you start going further back, it, you know, as you start getting into the 1800s, like, you know, it, they're, they're just like stuff, they're days that no one has ever scanned or has a copy of. So it just isn't there. The information just isn't there. Um, so that's a, you know, a challenge that uh, you have to turn to other sources to, to work on. So I don't really, haven't really answered your question, but it is an interesting question to ponder. Excellent question. Is there a map you know of that you would like access to that like, you can't get for copyright reasons or uh, restrictions in like military maps or like, whatever? Yeah, well, the main one that I'm, that I'm sort of trying to work on is there's a 1917 edition of uh, the GOAD insurance plan in the city of Toronto. And uh, York has a physical copy of it, but uh, they, they, they won't scan it. So. Um, and, that, that, and that's their prerogative because they have a particular environment where they are, they are actually getting sued by some other copyright collective. So they have kind of an environment where they're like, okay, we're not going to make trouble because we're, you know, it's lawyers and stuff. Uh, you know, just come back in like 10 years or whatever. Sorry. I, yeah, I know. So uh, technically the session is done. If you feel like, you know, sitting around and asking me more questions, uh, please do so. I, I release you from this, this session. Thank <laughs> you.